razones. <clears throat> okay, well, one minute maybe, and then we'll start. un'occasione di that is uh, the Ulysses is given here. Yesterday was the first time and there will be four more lectures this week and the next week. So Ulysses, uh, well, he speaks perfectly Italian, but uh, I think it's uh, more polite to speak in English. What do we prepare? Um, I don't know the audience. <coughs> is Italian. I could speak Italian as you wish. I see Cedric. Cedric's not Italian, ah, so yeah, maybe sure. okay. <laughs> should okay. speak. So, no worries. So he's Brazilian, uh, he got the degree there, and then he went for the PhD in UK, in uh, the famous Daram group with Paula Chadwick. And then he spent how many months in Italy? Uh, I spent three months. Three months, well. which was, were sufficient for him to speak perfectly Italian. <laughs> uh, he had a postdoc uh, in Max Planck in Munich, and uh, is now here visiting us for three months. <laughs> He's working in uh, MAGIC telescope, gamma ray astronomy. Uh, are you a member of any other instrument, official and member? CTA. And CTA. And, uh, today, and there is the SWIGO, of course. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and today is here to discuss this uh, peculiar uh, proposal for data sharing, which is of interest to our <coughs> MAGIC group too. MAGIC is this uh, telescope taking gamma ray data, and we aim to uh, not to keep our d the data for ourselves, but to, to, to disseminate the data. This project, well, we know that there are many ways to disseminate data, but this is a special project, and it's very uh, even good, uh, not only science-wise, but even for the people that will get in touch. So the seminar will be registered, and will be available in YouTube, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Michele, for the introduction. I think uh, the use of the word peculiar by Michele is correct because it's not very usual that uh, a project uh, for uh, data distribution or data sharing in astronomy is associated to the United Nations. Uh, in fact, I think it's the first uh, project of this kind. 
And uh, it is going to be a project that is going to be led by the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. So um, since this thing is beginning, uh, although we are working on this since uh, 2016, when uh, the Italian government proposed this thing to the UN, uh, it's been a long process. I mean, things at the UN take a long time. There's a lot of uh, discussions, agreements between peoples and countries. And, uh, but now it's going to officially start. So the idea is that the foundation of this initiative is going to happen within the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs in Vienna in the coming months. And we already foresee a first meeting of the steering board uh, which is the membership of the countries that are going to work on that to happen in Brazil uh, sometime in the next semester. So I'm going to talk a lot about the process, why we went to the UN, what we want to do with it, uh, what's the context, and a little bit about the astronomy that we are already doing with it and the impact it might have. Okay, so it's like a one-third uh, discussion of general things and uh, two, uh, two-thirds general discussion and one-third astronomy, maybe. So let's see. Um, okay, so here um, I'm giving this presentation on behalf of a, of a large group of people that uh, work on that, and especially Paolo Giomi, who at the time was at the Italia Space Agency, and he was kind of the person that was responsible for uh, working the concrete parts of the initiative within the UN from the Italian side. So this was a proposal that was put forward by Battiston uh, uh, in ASI, and then Jomi was uh, the responsible for data in Asia at the time, and he was uh, taking the lead on that. And Jorge del Rio Vera is the officer of the UN who is working with us to establish the thing within the UN. And of course, there is a lot of support from Simoneta Di Pippo, who is the director of the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs. Okay. So I think there are two premises uh, to this initiative. At least these were the things that motivated the proposal of this thing uh, by Italy back in 2016. And, and I think the first of these premises is the realization that we are on the verge of a dramatic increase in the volume of data that astronomy is going to produce. So in working out the initiative, we had a series of seminars and workshops and meetings. And uh, this is one uh, is a graph that was presented by Roland Walter from, from Geneva in one of our meetings at the, at the, uh, in Vienna a couple of years ago. And it's very interesting because you see that uh, uh, if you put the numbers uh, where we are now, we are about to have uh, really a, a qualitative change in the way you are going to have to deal with data in astronomy. So the sum of the major uh, facilities in astronomy are going to produce an amount of data which is equivalent to what the LHC produces. So really this changes the way you have to deal with information. So for example, if you count CTA, uh, this, is, this amounts to something like 30 terabytes per day of data. But if you put SKA, this is about 30 terabytes per year per living astronomer, per living professional astronomer in the world, not only radio astronomer. So it's obvious from this that a lot of challenges in the te information technology side are going to come up in astronomy, but we are going to have much, much more data than we can deal with. So the pressure to transform this data into effective knowledge is going to increase on our side because these experiments are very expensive, they produce a lot of information, and I think it's expected that the amount of knowledge that we are going to take from, from this great increase in data is also correspondingly large. So we have to produce two orders of magnitude more knowledge by, the, by 2030 than we do today. Otherwise, it can be, oh, it's not fair with the public money that we are using. Let's see if this moves. Okay, I went back. Okay. Okay. And so this is a plot that is uh, from the uh, original proposal that the Italian government put to, to the UN. And it just uh, wants to show what I just said. So uh, if you increase the number of people that use the data, as a consequence of also the amount of knowledge that you produce from information increases, and what we could cost, the specific cost of knowledge reduces. So this is a question that if the data can arrive at more people, then uh, uh, the, the scientific knowledge that we, we achieve is cheaper. So 25 years ago, uh, the astronomical data were they may be used by a small group of 10 to the two, 100 or a few hundred specialists. And this has increased over time 
because of the efforts of initiatives like the virtual observatory and the increase of uh, sharing of information. People from different fields can use data from different specialties in astronomy in a large multi-wavelength multi -wavelength effort because it's easier to reduce and analyze this data today. No, there was a lot of effort put on that and, and there is protocols that help to integrate the information. But really, the ideal for the future is that uh, this, the, the astronomical data, the real astronomical data, not the images that are used for outreach only, but the real astronomical data can be used by uh, much more people from the public as well, including citizen scientists for education, so real astronomical data on the schools and at universities, at a teaching level, and um, in any case, for any interested uh, citizen that wants to have access to this data. I mean, the main logic behind that is that they are paying for, for the information, so this should be as open as possible. Um, there was a report that was put out by the American uh, Society for the Advancement of Science, and uh, it uh, predicted that within 10 years, citizen scientists are going to be doing fundamental discoveries in science through open data. So that's a very interesting perspective. I mean, if, if uh, people that are good, uh, kids that are good on computer can start playing with the data and find interesting things, I think that's where we want to go, yes? We have to populate the world of the web uh, with, uh, with good things, with information that is positive, that people can use and can be attracted to what we call STEM disciplines, you know, science, technology, uh, mathematics. Okay, so if you type this on Google, this number here, this code, these are the codes for the documents of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, uh, you are going to find the original proposal. It's uh, open online uh, by, the, by the government of Italy for the Open Universe Initiative. So it was proposed uh, by Italy as an initiative to be taken by COPPO. So this was a committee that was created in the, in the space uh, race era, in the beginning of the, the Cold War, to guarantee that uh, activity in space would not be militarized and would be essentially peaceful. So it regulates everything from telecommunications to bands that uh, satellites can use for, and, uh, but also it regulates, uh, I don't know, space debris uh, and uh, what is allowed and not allowed to do, to do in space. And so it was proposed to them in preparation for this meeting, which was Unispace Plus 50, which happened uh, two years ago. And it was the celebration of the first conference of the UN in 68 on the peaceful uses of outer space. So the main goal of the initiative was to dramatically, as proposed to the UN, is to dramatically expand the availability and access to space science data, responding to the growing demands of transparency on the use of public resources and of the social returns of science. So when we say expanding the availability and access, it's not just for the specialists. It's really beyond the specialized level, okay? There is, for example, the virtual observatory that does a great job in making data available for other specialists. And in fact, it is the basis where we can build such an initiative. So this really wants to go beyond. And uh, the, the motivations were the two things that I already said. So the logic is, by going from the raw data and the basic information on, on the observations, through different steps of analysis, interpretation to knowledge, the most, this level of information here, the high level data is available to people in a way that's easily usable, easily integratable, uh, accessible online for, uh, with um, good data mining tools, then this knowledge becomes really democratized. And that's the idea of the initiative. I think we have gone a, a long way uh, from going to the, to the raw archives of data, then to some uh, repositories online, and today we have a lot of resources from many space agencies and institutions. But it's still, um, there is some level, uh, for most of this information, there is some level of technical knowledge that stays on the way of the use of this information to science or really to understanding astronomy. So we really want to take uh, this barrier out. So that's the proposal of the initiative. An interesting thing, this, is, this I took from a report that this funding agency in Brazil has uh, hired uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, so they wanted to understand the impact of Brazilian science according to fields and things like this. So if you see here the number of papers uh, produced in Brazil by uh, the different uh, disciplines and the impact factor, you see that space science doesn't have 
that much number of papers being produced. But the impact factor is very large, as it is with physics, but it's even larger. And if you see, uh, if you look at the correlation between this impact and the number of international collaborations in the publications, you see that that's the reason why the impact is higher. So it's why to do this kind of uh, opening of data at large through space science, or not through genetics, biology? Well, there is initially the attraction of astronomy. Astronomy really uh, you know, attracts the interests of young people, the fascination of the public, so it's a good entry door into, the, um, uh, into science. Uh, but uh, uh, space science is uh, one of the most internationally collaborative uh, um, disciplines that exist. So by doing this, we are automatically improving international collaboration between countries, when, when you are, which is uh, an important factor when you are talking about development. So if you want science to start at a certain level in countries that have uh, almost no science, um, some level of international collaboration of people that go there and do capacity building is necessary. So uh, space science is a field where this naturally is more prone to happen. So it also justifies that we do this uh, in astronomy. So, a bit bureaucratic now. So, uh, why has the UN accepted such a proposal? Um, so, there is something in the UN which is called the Space 2030 Agenda. So, which is uh, how space is going to respond to the sustainable development goals. And there is an effort to understand how, how the space uh, sector can, uh, can answer to each of the 17 sustainable development goals, which all the governments now have to sign to and make proposals and things like this. And so uh, one of the pillars of this Space 2030 agenda is space accessibility. So to try to give access to space to the most number of countries and people. And the other uh, three pillars are space economy, so to improve the economy of countries through space activity. For example, monitoring crops from space, so you can increase their productivity. Um, space society, space diplomacy, so using the international collaboration, strengthening the international collaboration for the peaceful users of outer space so that the stakes become higher for someone destroying a satellite in orbit or using the orbit in a military way, which is something that is, um, whose, whose risk is really increasing. I mean, we see France building a, a space force, the US is proposing a space force, other countries are, are talking about that. So very soon, there is the danger there is going to be weapons on, uh, on space. And if you think about it, there is a, a nuclear war. Uh, there, are, there are satellites that are, uh, work on uh, nuclear power that are defunct and just in orbit. So if you, if you blow one of those down and uh, make it fall um, in a certain place, it can be dangerous. So there is a lot of danger uh, in, in uh, militarizing the, the space. And if you increase the collaboration between the countries through science, um, you can increase the stakes of doing this. So it's, it's, it's harder for you to, to do something against a, a colleague or a friend. So um, space accessibility in this agenda is really important because it's the way to bring new players uh, into, the, into the game of space, which is, a, is, a, is an economy that um, is forecast to increase a lot. So today, the GDP of all the space activities is around $300 billion a year, of which 5% uh, of this money is spent on science. So it's not that much, but it's still sizable. And, uh, uh, but there is a, a f two fundamental underlying goals to space accessibility, so which is uh, sharing the benefits of the space exploration among us, so allowing people to, to, to get into this. And uh, an important thing is uh, that uh, through space accessibility, we can reduce the inequality of opportunities in the growing space sector. There is a lot of uh, economic development that can come from the industrial developments of the space sector, right? and we have seen that in the last 50 years of space exploration. But very little of this has gone through to countries that are not space-faring nations. So a way to kind of distribute this is something that we look for. Okay, so this is just the SDGs. Uh, the Open Universe Initiative aims to tackle directly this quality education and capacity building. So to uh, educate people in uh, space science so that then you can start developing a space sector in the different countries. So 
I think that uh, today data is really the entry door to science in general, but also to, but especially to space science. So if you consider the forms of accessibility to space, you can, you can think of uh, direct access to the orbit, which companies are starting to do now, uh, technology and facilities, uh, so development of technology to access the orbit or to use in, in, in orbit, education and data. And of all these, I mean, these two are very hard. You need a lot of development to get there. These two are connected. But I think data is really uh, at the basis for, for you to do real education on the field. Um, and it's the most sustainable of the entry points because it's cheap. So there is a lot of data already available to make this data more accessible. You don't have to spend too many resources just to have to wish to do that. And uh, it's a secure starting level because a lot of the spin-offs of uh, being able to use uh, data can be applied in other sectors of the economy. So a lot of the economy of the future is going to be based on um, uh, data science. And uh, so you can train people that are useful for, for many things. And also there are other aspects. For example, uh, by doing this, you can increase uh, international cooperation for development allow that new players start to, to play an important role in the, in the field and develop an impactful South-South cooperation. So in one of the panels where we were discussing this in one of the UN meetings, Jim Green, with the chief scientist of NASA, was present. And he underlined that this was probably what he considered the most interesting thing. Because usually, when the underdeveloped countries or the developing countries have to look for, for ways to improve their, their research sector or their industrial sector, they look to the north. So they look to the US, they look to Europe. But having the data available and having some capacity building activities on site in these countries allow them to start doing things with themselves. And this is much more effective in producing new capabilities. For example, a very nice initiative about this related to radio astronomy is the, is the uh, African uh, VLBI network that are, they are starting now. So the different countries are using defunct antennas, uh, use it for telecommunications, rebuilding them, and uh, start doing VLBI among themselves. So not only with uh, countries that are more developed. So they have to challenge the things together and they have to build capacity by themselves together. And this takes them much further. So this is a very important thing. About the new players, uh, for example, there is some subtleties here. So uh, many countries do have um, astronomical facilities, small or medium-sized telescopes, a small network of observatories is scattered. But this cannot compete with the large instruments. And also, they don't have many resources to, to improve or, or, or to kind of advertise this data or use this data at high level. But if data accessibility goes on the two ways, so the people can use the data that is produced by the big facilities, but the people can also have, uh, it's facilitated the publication of the information that small observatory produces, you will start to make more valuable the information that these small institutions produce. Justifying that investment increases in these institutions, also that you can start developing sustainable research in these places. So for small observatories, this is very important. And one of the things that the initiative wants to do is to identify small facilities around the world that need help to publish data and help this data to, to get out. And uh, so this is, this is an important thing. OK, let me tell a story that I, I, I usually tell when, when we have the meetings at the UN and we have to convince the diplomats that uh, this thing is useful. So, um, well, the physics in Brazil started thanks to, to a few Italian guys. One of them was Occhialini, and, uh, the, uh, and uh, the other was Gleb Vatagin, which was a Russian-Italian that went to Brazil uh, in the 30s. And uh, the first student of, this, of uh, Gleb Vatagin at the University of São Paulo, he was hired to start the physics department at the University of São Paulo, was Cesar Lattes. And uh, so um, Vatagin was very clever because he was a theoretician, but he understood that uh, you cannot start science where there is no science with theoretical physics. Okay? It's very limited, the kind of skills that you developed through theoretical physics. If you do experimental physics, you train the people in a series of skills that then they can go to other places and, and I mean, you create more easily critical mass. And so he decided to, to change his, uh, his uh, research focus to uh, experimental physics, and in particular, a field of experimental physics that was cheap and sustainable, 
and was in the forefront of research, which was cosmic ray physics. So to develop the cosmic ray detectors that he needed was cheap, it was at hand, and he could do science that was at the forefront of, this, of research because they were discovering the fundamental particles using that at the time. So this is very important. Um, so he trained the first generation. Lattes went to Bristol. So there he worked with Occhialini and they discovered the pion, which was a long sort particle after, after uh, the prediction of Yukawa. Um, not only that, Lattes went to California, to, to Berkeley, where they were building the first accelerator. And it was Lattice who realized that they were producing artificial pions in the accelerator. So it's the birth of accelerator science. So all this happened uh, 10 years after the 10 to 15 years after the first physics department was created in Brazil. When Lattice came back, he had such a fame uh, from his discoveries that he could kind of uh, uh, steer the government and, uh, and the military, the, the, the industrial class, to uh, put money to the development of formal science in Brazil. So my institute was created in 49, so 20 years after Lattes was, or less than 15 years after, after Lattes graduated. And, uh, and also the first funding agency in Brazil was created a few, a few years later. So in 20 years, you went from nothing to have organized science in a country. And why is that? I think that an important thing is that there was a choice uh, by some people that were responsible for starting science in the country, so these scientists which I mentioned, to uh, be careful in choosing a sustainable uh, entry point to science, which in this case was uh, cosmic ray physics, which was also the case for post-war Japan. And then, of course, uh, it's not by chance that the first international collaboration then was the Brazilian-Japanese collaboration in Chacautaya. And so there was a lot of interplay between that. Um, but so to find a sustainable entry point for the development of science in countries is very important. Otherwise, you waste the resources. And I think data today has, has this, uh, fills this gap. Because as I said, it's cheap, it's available, and you can do frontier research with it. So the, the data that we produce with the large instruments, in principle, anyone that has this data, and some good ideas and some good training, can do serious research at top level. And, but, and if you don't do that, if you don't have uh, real science happening, discoveries, important discoveries, then you really cannot motivate <laughs> that the country then invests in science. Now, I always quote this guy as well, because I, I think it's very peculiar that the opening speech of the first UN space conference in the, uh, was given by Pope Paul VI. But you understand why when you read uh, some, some uh, uh, parts of his, uh, his speech, which I think are, uh, are in line with what we are proposing here. So he says that if the benefits of the use of outer space are put in spite of justice to the service of only a small group of nations in exclusion of others, who then would fail to realize that the recent and wonderful discoveries of science have turned themselves against men and now work for, for, its, for his unhappiness instead of contributing to the happiness of humanity? He's talking about uh, technological development that drives growth of inequality between countries. Yes? Uh, scientific and technological progress are not usually matched by comparable progress in moral legislation and international cooperation for the benefit of all peoples. Uh, I think here, particularly of those who own to their lower state of technological or cultural development are kept in a state of unjust inferiority. To use the resources of space exploration for the benefit of all is to contribute to advance humanity to justice and peace. So there is a moral duty to use science for development, if you think about this. And I, space science is such a driver for technological development that opening the opportunity of the space sector for other peoples is, is really important. So what are the pillars of the, uni the Open Universe Initiative? Where we want to work uh, with it? So in, in the workshop uh, that we did on 2017, um, by the way, Piero Benvenuti is not here anymore, but uh, he, was, uh, he was very important on this. He was in this meeting, and he was one of the people who helped drafting the directions of this, uh, do this fundamental document. Oh, so there is something happening here. One. Ah, okay. Okay. And so, in this meeting, where we stayed for a couple of uh, days uh, in Vienna discussing with uh, Piero, representing the IAU, with uh, Beppe Fabiano, Mark Allen from the VO, so all the people that uh, 
work with uh, open data, uh, we devised these three lines of, uh, of uh, action, these three pillars of action for the Open Universe Initiative. For the first one is to increase transparency. So basically, uh, try to promote these uh, fair guiding principles for, for open data, which is to help the data to be easily findable on the web, easily accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, in this way, uh, we expect that, uh, I mean, we aim to, to increase uh, the number of people using the data. But the most important thing, and there is a condition for that, is that the data that's available, it has to be high level data with PI quality calibration. So the information that the, uh, everybody gets is the same information as, as, as the mission PIs have access to. Otherwise, it's, it's not as good as we can do. Another important aspect is to resurface data. So there are lots of fields of astronomy, of space science, uh, and lots of uh, facilities around the world, especially the small and medium ones, whose data gets completely lost or whose data is not, uh, is not openly available. One example is my field, which is gamma ray astronomy, uh, ground-based gamma ray astronomy, which for a series of technical justifiable reasons doesn't have uh, data, open data to the community up to now. The same thing is cosmic rays. So we think I, we could do better than this, uh, also because we use public money to do the research, and so to try to uh, help and uh, to push for the openness of data through, through, uh, to, through all the fields is one of the, the things that the initiative uh, wants to do. And, um, and of course, another thing is what I already mentioned. There are lots of small instruments and facilities in less developed countries that could have their data published and so that they can start taking part in research. Um, regular monitoring, standard observations that we use in everyday research can be, can, uh, can be useful for, for, for real uh, scientific uh, work. And this produced by data maybe get lost. Um, talking about this uh, public resurface of data or publication of, uh, of data by instruments, it was estimated that uh, you just have to change by 5%. So it increases in 5% the cost to production model of space missions if you want to go to standard uh, data centers as we have now with low level data to high level data. So it increases only 5% of the cost of a mission to have uh, uh, all the data at, uh, already reduced published. And through this, you broaden the user base of astronomy and space science and you, you can do all the impacts that we were mentioning. So, um, uh, the pro in the process, I mean, uh, we, we got through COPOS, it was approved, it's on the Space 2030 agenda, the initiative, and uh, UNOS is going to be the central point of it. And uh, the, the formal basis to that is the mandate that the UNOS has since Unispace 3, which was the conference in 1999, to increase scientific knowledge of near and outer space by promoting cooperative activities in astronomy and space sciences, uh, uh, realizing that it's a unique position to bring together all relevant stakeholders to achieve these proposed goals. And here is the important thing. I mean, the UN is not going to do VO work, astronomical work, but the idea is that it can bring the, the important stakeholders together, the space agents to talk, to revise cost to uh, completion models of missions, or the different institutions, or uh, help um, initiatives for open data that are produced in the technical side by the VO to become a capacity building actions in, uh, in Africa, in South America, in South Asia, in places where you, you can really do, do something uh, more for the people. And, uh, and for example, we had an interesting exchange with Stefan Wolfram. Uh, he was at my institute some time ago. I talked to him about the initiative. And uh, two months later, we were sitting together with him and the UN to discuss possibilities for Mathematica uh, to, to give some of its software for open data in astronomy. One of the things that is obviously useful is, for example, semantic search that uh, we can do on the web or we can do, but we cannot do in VO. And what about if you start integrating semantic search? It helps a lot for students and, and, and people from the public to use. Another thing that we can investigate is the use of uh, blockchain information to take the data. So you can better control the quality of the data if it comes from, from an institution that's not uh, so uh, authoritative, for example, or a small observatory. And you can do clever things with the, the, also the storing of the information, but also flagging the information. So there are ways of controlling the quality of the information in doing this. But of course, as alone, it's difficult. But if you have a, a broker like the UN that can bring together uh, strong institutions like, for example, One for Research or who else? Google, 
uh, then you can start doing very nice things. And that's the power of the UN in this. I think that was a very clever move uh, to, to look for them for help in this. And just a little justification why uh, the, the data for space accessibility is sustainable, as I mentioned. Because if we work more together, and again, it's the, it's the brokerage of the UN entering here, uh, we can uh, harvest more all the technologies and fundamental power that is in place already with uh, things like the VO. And uh, so we also avoid duplication of, uh, of efforts. I imagine that many of the efforts that ESA has for its uh, outreach or open data platforms or, I don't know, other VO institutions or NASA, but there's a lot of du duplication of efforts there. We can kind of increase the collaboration and combine these two agreements between the institutions to, to push the thing forward for development. Uh, this is something that is important that we could uh, work in the high level, so in the ministerial level, to demand for uh, data centers. Uh, so now all the missions have a, a, a raw data center. Data is, is open, everybody understands it's important, and it should be like that. But this is because the government started to push the space agents, for example, NASA and NASA to do this, because they understood it was fundamental that uh, the information was available for increasing productivity and accessibility to all. Uh, 20 years ago, it was not like that. So we have to push for the next level that uh, we really have data centers that have the reduced data easily accessible to everybody. Okay, and it's not so expensive. It was estimated 5% cost. Um, global coordination and cooperation, and of course, developing new technological paradigms and innovative tools uh, that can have impact in education and capacity building. I'm going to show something about that. So this is just so that you want, if you want to look at the slides later, here is the list of all the formal steps that we have gone through, uh, the, the initiative, and all the documents that uh, have been produced. So you can read everything uh, about the, the initiative here. Um, as I mentioned already, these next steps, there is going to be a kickoff meeting. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's going to happen yet this year, but the idea is to go maximum in January. And, uh, and then we should have a first, a first meeting of the steering board. Uh, so what's going to be the structure of the initiative? Because, I mean, one of the ideas of, uh, of giving this presentation is that maybe some of you are interested in participating somehow to it. And uh, so the, the infrastructure that we have taught is that in the beginning there is going to be uh, a guidance of uh, UNOSA uh, that then is going to do only the secretariat, but in the beginning it's important that UNOSA uh, has a say on where things go, and member states. And this is kind of the high level indication, so it's probably through the foreign offices and the foreign representation, the diplomatic representation at the UN, that uh, people are going to be indicated to sit on this board and understand where, where the initiative is going to go. The idea is that there is going to be uh, different groups focused on data science tools, uh, infrastructure for data, uh, data formats or, or, or data provision, and uh, capacity building initiatives. The idea is that, uh, I mean, the, the countries that are participating or have people that are interested in participate, um, uh, understand what resources are available, what people want to do, and organize the groups in a, in a very horizontal and um, informal structure in the sense that different groups can participate and cooperate and then uh, the contributions come through, through the country representation. And uh, the idea is that, uh, of course, the, no, the United Nations also is not going to have data centers and uh, technical people, but this is going to be maintained through a distributed infrastructure. So, for example, the institutions that cooperate, uh, they can be VO centers, they can be space agencies, they can be departments, can have uh, some uh, infra local infrastructure for data provision. Of course, we have to have uh, uh, communication protocols in place so that uh, this can be accessible. For, for everybody in a, in a distributed way. The idea is so that uh, we use the infrastructure that is available in the countries, and so the cost should not be very large. So the real new cost should be on this, so to develop things that then can be used uh, beyond the specialist community. And this is already some proto-nodes that are in place. So there is uh, quite a few groups that are doing something. There is AS in Italy, there is also ICRANET in Italy, there is CBPF in Brazil, the University of La Plata in Argentina, uh, the Armenian Academy of Sciences, uh, um, a, a telescope network in Russia, 
Purple Mountain Observatory, very important observatory in China, uh, the Technical University of Munich, uh, uh, and uh, the New York University in Abu Dhabi have already started doing things this. So these are people that we met in the, in the meetings of the UN, and that's where it started. But now it should start formalizing a bit more. Um, Okay, I think this is, uh, so this is some activities that we have already done. So in preparation and in demonstrating that the, this initiative can work, we have done some activities uh, for data transparency. And basically, this is led by the Italian Space Agency through our web portal. I'm going to show you something about it. Data accessibility. So uh, we are developing some new software uh, to produce the enhanced data products. There is also uh, a particular work from the BRICS uh, community on this. I'm going to explain you about it. And some uh, capacity building activities that have started. And one interesting thing is that uh, the first uh, spin-off of this is that we started publishing papers and doing new science. So if you develop tools that are good for data mining, uh, data integration, and things like this, the first consequence is research. So as soon as we do the things, we also publish a paper associated to it. So it increases collaboration and, and, and science. So it, it's, been, it's been interesting for us. So this is the open universe portal that we have at ASI. How is my time, Nicola? Okay, I have 15, 10 minutes. Okay, so this is the open universe portal that is in ASI. So basically the first idea is to demonstrate the integrability of data. And so uh, it was something that was put together very quickly there by the SSDC. And uh, this was led by, by Jomi. And uh, the idea was that uh, we create a, a, an integrated resource where basically you can access very easily all the main data, open data providers in the world, in the web, uh, through, through this portal, and you can do simultaneous search for data in all of them. And then you can, it's more easily you can retrieve the, the resources. And uh, so, for example, when you look for, uh, for uh, an AGN like 3C273, then you, it opens for you all the resources available in the web through with that which have uh, followed the view protocols uh, that have this information available, and uh, you can then browse through all these resources. The level of integration is still small, but this is something that was done very quickly just to demonstrate how uh, we can do little things that help people kind of mine the information that is available. So we also developed some tools like this VOU SED. So this is a, a, an enhanced version of the set builder that there is already in the uh, ASI Science Data Center. And the, one of the main features of this is that uh, it follows VO protocol. So it's not restricted to the data that is inside the uh, SSDC database in ASI, but it can, can search all the uh, open VO databases that are available through the different uh, portals uh, on the web. So you can, uh, it retrieves you all this, the SED information that, that is available openly for any given AGN or, or, or source in general. And uh, so you can see here the sky map with the coincidences and the, and the, and the counterparts that were chosen in the cross-matching process. And uh, you can retrieve all the data in a very usable uh, way also if you are a specialist. Uh, you, can, you can use it, it's very useful. And then there was some, uh, Jomi was playing a bit with this, and this is a temporal evolution. So we, he made some videos from, from this. So here is the light curve, I think, in Fermi. And uh, so here you can see the highlighted data at each moment of this uh, observation. So you can see the temporal evolution of the SED. This is very good for students, for example, to visualize the information of uh, what it means that uh, vari spectral variability is connected to flux variability in, uh, in AGNs across the SED. Uh, we started some fronts, which is basically associated to our research. So for example, now there is the, the Chinese and the Russian groups want to start a database of open debris because they work with small solar system bodies on open debris, which by the way is a very interesting thing because I don't know if you know, but the space debris um, information is, is uh, considered sensitive. So there is no open data, uh, de open debris, uh, space debris uh, information. Usually the countries control it, the military watch it very closely. But the UN uh, thought, I mean, in the, we had a meeting at the UN two weeks ago, uh, the World Space Forum, 
And uh, one of the things that were being discussed is the impact, for example, of the mega constellations in astronomical observations. We are going to see constellations of satellites now. There is hundreds of satellites, thousands of satellites uh, working together. And uh, so this is going to affect astronomical observation, uh, as it is already affecting. Yeah? Some of the Elon Musk uh, satellites have been captured by, by large telescopes. And, uh, and of course, when you have uh, actions that, uh, um, for example, some time ago, the Chinese blew up a satellite in space just to show that they could do that, and this kind of tripled the number of, uh, of space debris that were in orbit. This is dangerous because it can create encounters, close encounters with satellites and destroy satellites. One example was what happened with ESA two months ago. Chandra almost, I think it was Chandra, almost, almost had a collision with a satellite, had to be deviated with a few hours uh, notice because uh, the communication was down and uh, it had to, to do a maneuver uh, very quickly. Of course, it is a probability of collision, yes? Maybe there was not, nothing was going to happen, but there was a danger and they had to maneuver it. So you risk losing a satellite of uh, hundreds of millions of euros. But now, this information of the orbits of these debris are not available. Uh, because it's, it's, it's treated as sensitive. But we are understanding that maybe there is a case uh, to make this open. And there are two groups in the initiative that want to lead this, this, uh, this work on creating the first uh, database, open database for space debris. So there are some interesting things that can start happening when you start collaborating with open data, things that were not predicted in the beginning. So we never thought of challenging the, the community in this way before. Um, but one of the things that we are concentrating is open universe for blazers. So to do um, applications for blazer science. And one interesting thing that we developed was the Swift Deep Sky. And we published a paper on that a few months ago. So basically what we did is to, got all the, to get all the HISARC uh, software uh, with some uh, properly done uh, Swift uh, uh, pipelines and uh, put it in, in a Docker container so that you can easily distribute it and you can easily do distributed data analysis with it and everything controlled because the, the Docker is a, is a closed environment. It's also good because it doesn't depend on operational system. You don't have to install anything. It's there for you. And uh, with that, we could uh, do some very quick and very efficient analysis of the, of the, the 14 years of Swift, Swift archive. And for example, we produced the, the largest database of uh, Swift observations for blazers ever. So we analyzed all the 11,000 Swift XRT observation of blazers. This took us only a few weeks, a couple of weeks, uh, with um, normal computer clusters that we have in our, in our different groups. And, um, and so this already uh, shows the, the power of uh, going a little bit uh, just a step ahead on what you can do with software and in the impact it can have on producing uh, information from the data that you have. So here is just a, a, a detail of this paper. You, you're welcome to look at that and uh, you can see all the collaborators that have been working on that with us. And then, of course, now we continue, and uh, there is other papers that the different groups are preparing. So this is, uh, then we get all that information of the 11,000 blazer pointings, and we produce the largest ever database of, of X-ray spectra for blazers. So we get all the blazers that have been targeted more than 100 times, and uh, we produce very good spectra and information on spectral variability for all of them. So, and every, all the things that we do, we put uh, available on the web. So, the idea is that uh, if we start doing this, so thinking of clever tools that can make data easily analyzable by other people, uh, we also can produce more science among ourselves and we are invited to publish this in, a, in an open way. Uh, bear in mind that to operate this Docker, you have to do nothing apart from giving the sky region that you want to analyze and it gives you the result. And the other thing that we do is that if you allow, when it analyzes the result, it also sends it to us so that we can keep an up-to-date uh, database that is kind of built upon crowd sharing. You know? So you analyze some data and the central database gets updated. So you don't have to be worrying about building catalogs. It builds up by itself as people use it. And if there is new data, then you can over, overwrite uh, previous information that is obsolete. And it's, it's, it's really not very difficult. It's just, a, it's just a small step. So we are doing the same now. Um, with light curves, ah, so here is the spectrum, the sources for which we have produced the spectra. And uh, 
You can also uh, work with uh, light curves as well. So one of our collaborators in Armenia, uh, Nerek Sahakian, is doing this for Fermi uh, LAT. So he's analyzing all the Fermi LAT uh, uh, blazer observations and producing very, very good uh, adaptive binning light curves that are going to be made available uh, online for everybody. And uh, okay, this was, was another interesting thing. It's a, it's a paper that uh, we are working on as well. So um, we are trying to do what is going to be the most complete or one of the most complete X-ray sky surveys ever, just using the same Swift Deep Sky that we had. How do you do this? Uh, we simply targeted, uh, got all the GRB fields that were uh, observed and analyzed all the Swift fields that had uh, a point in towards the GRB so that you have a homogeneous distribution on the sky over the 14 years of Swift observations. And uh, so, so only with this uh, survey, so this is, is a plot of the, the minimum flux obtained uh, through the area of the sky covered by the survey. And these are all the X-ray surveys service that are available. So you can see that you have some surveys that go very deep, but they cover a very small area in the sky. When you go to large areas in the sky, you don't have uh, so much... Uh, uh, I mean, you don't have a very good completion in terms of flux. So this is what we obtained with uh, these uh, serendipitous GRB observations. So it's already competitive with the best uh, X-ray uh, X service of the sky, and it was done in a few weeks using this kind of software. Then there was a training school. So one of the guys that usually participates in our meetings in, in uh, in the UN is, uh, is the one of the responsibles for the, open, uh, for the uh, New York University in Abu Dhabi. It's an Italian called uh, Arneudo, Fernando Arneudo, uh, Francesco Arneudo, sorry. And he, he invited us to go there in Abu Dhabi at the New York University and do some training with the students. And uh, we trained them to use this software and a bit about uh, Asian astronomy, X-ray astronomy. And the result is that they uh, use this software to make uh, now analyze all the Swift XRT data, okay? And so we have the, this most complete uh, X-ray uh, survey uh, over a large area of the sky. So this was done by students, okay? So it's not so difficult if you make software that uh, kind of breaks the barrier of, uh, of software, technological, in understanding of the mission and things like this, which is very specialized which is going to continue to be important for people who want to do breakthrough science at really the frontier, because you have to analyze the data in a very clever and special way. But for day-by-day -day things that have an impact, if you, if you make the right tools, many people can contribute to that, okay? So I think my time is over, and there are some works. So this is a, a work with, uh, that the people in TUM are doing. And uh, so they are building, they are getting the neutrino tracks from IceCube, and as soon as a neutrino track arrives, uh, there is a software that we are developing that goes to search for all the counterparts and it produces a report. So this is all the possible counterparts that you can find and it tries to do some selection, what's, what's the best, what's not in an automatic way. And uh, what happens is that it produces you a report with all the candidates neutrino counterparts in the field automatically. So as soon as a neutrino information arrives, it gives you all the possible counterparts for, the, for, the, for that neutrino in terms of AGNs and publishes it online. So it's already available for everybody, okay? So, and then just to say that we had a meeting, uh, there is a, a group, uh, so the BRICS uh, community, uh, the BRICS countries the, have identified five areas of uh, strategic cooperation. One of them is astronomy, because it can have a big impact in attracting people to science and things like this. Um, so there is a working group which is made by ministerial people and scientists to try to find some uh, common ground for cooperation between the BRICS. And uh, there is an expectation that then the BRICS Development Bank is going to fund these initiatives, one per area. So there is uh, water resources, and there is also astronomy, okay? 
And uh, so one thing that we, want to, we understood that uh, now after a few years of discussion, it's interesting to do, is to create a BRICS optical telescope network, which starts to be very interesting in the sense of following up of transients, these large transients, uh, that, uh, the larger number of transients that's going to come up through LSST and things like this, but also multi-messenger transients. And uh, so following up neutrino alerts, gravitational wave alerts. So the idea is to create a software infrastructure that integrates and uses a percentage of time or all the time, if it's a small facility, of BRICS instruments uh, that are all over the globe, so that you can uh, have effectively an optical network for following transients. And the idea uh, is that all the data is going to be available through Open Universe. So automatically, so it's these kinds of initiatives that are an example of how you can um, do science, but automatically think on a spin-off where you benefit the public and the, the general community. We are going to produce much more data if this goes forward as predicted, as we can analyze as well. So we are perfectly happy that people in other countries use this data for doing their own research. Why not? And or training students and things like this. So this is just a, a picture. And uh, OK, these are the conclusion. And uh, I leave here the invitation that anyone who wants to participate uh, talk to me. But of course, then I can put you in contact with the people in Italy which are, who are responsible for that. Thank you. Uh, well, so this is what you hear until uh, the end of January, more or less. So if you want to talk to him in person, you can, you can just come. Uh, do you have any questions or comments? Or this is. <coughs> Yes, I mean, of course, if you want to, I mean, the use of the, the database and whatever that we do is open for everybody. So, for example, if you want to have uh, some, uh, you can if I say, ah, I would like to do something with my schools or my universities. Can you do some uh, thing for us? Can you do some capacity building for us? Can, you, can we organize a meeting in Colombia? This is possible. Um, if you want to contribute as an institution, so you produce data or you like to do software stuff um, and you want to contribute, this is also possible. It's open. You just, you just, you, you make an offer, you, you, you join us. So the, the idea is that, uh, uh, I mean, it's an integration of things. It's not that someone takes ownership of the work of anybody, but as you do something, you make it available. We try to work together to integrate it to what is uh, available red of infrastructure. And of, but of course, uh, it, 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 uh, the fact your ownership is maintained. I mean, everybody's going to know that that's your work. So this is one thing. If you want to get formally involved as a country, then you have to, this have, has to pass through your foreign representation at the United Nations. So it's somehow you have to understand what's the process that you can through probably your Minister of, Ministry of Science or you know, the International Affairs Office of the, your Ministry of Science to talk with the UN representation. Of course, we, we have contact with these people. I, I probably remember seeing in some of these meetings the, the Colombian uh, representative in Copos. So we ca you can always contact us and we can help uh, you get in touch directly with the representation and then you do the formal steps that are needed in your country. What does this mean? This means that then Colombia officially joins the Open Universe Initiative. It participates on the steering board that makes the decisions so probably someone high level is going to be there, and it's going to uh, help steer and, 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 and give the directions to the initiative. There is also an expectation that the countries that participate give some commitment, uh, some kind of contribution. This can be direct money so that to the UN, so that it, it does capacity building activities around the world, and this probably becomes a share of Colombia's contribution to the United Nations, which is something that's already provided for in, in the budgets of the governments. And, uh, but uh, also, for example, you can commit for some observatory of Colombia to uh, produce data in a way that is open and, um, and is going to, to feed through, with the, through, the, through the initiative. Um, with the criteria and uh, the requirements that the initiative uh, asks for in terms of uh, accessibility and things like this. So I don't know if my answer is clear, but there is many ways in which you can contribute. The formal contribution 
uh, it can take a bit of work because you have to convince your, your government that uh, they want to be part of this. But uh, it's, it's, it's not impossible. I mean, this happened. We contacted some scientists in Argentina. Uh, they, they did that. And uh, there are some Chilean colleagues that are doing that. And Uruguay also. So there is a, there is a movement in many countries. It's, it's usually, I mean, that's a positive initiative. So especially our countries that are developing countries, they find it very nice that uh, they, can, they can be part of something that can have a benefit to us, direct benefit to us. Well, my answer to this question is that, uh, I mean, I don't think it's our job to, to kind of uh, tutor what people do with information in a sense that, uh, for example, how do you uh, get to rely on the publication of a group that puts out a paper on AGN in, I don't know, in Thailand? There is a peer review process. There is a process that legitimizes it. If it's simply put out in the web, you probably wouldn't uh, use that for, for your research. Or if it's really interesting, then you can go there and check with the same data because the data is open. I mean, the best way to control the quality of result is that the data is open. If someone uses completely open data to produce a result, you can, you can go there and check. It's much worse when the data is not open and uh, you go through a peer review where you never see the, the information that was used to produce the results and you just see the final equation or the final fit, and you saw no step of, uh, of analyzing the result. If the result is produced by an authoritative collaboration, so SWIFT itself or FERM itself puts the high-level data available, then you know the analysis is okay because you cannot know better. And then if someone uses that for a wrong conclusion, it's easy. You can just get the same data and show that it's wrong. So I think... Well, then people can do, no, I mean, uh, the, they, we share only the data. Then scientific results, w w what we are doing with this data, we publish on academic uh, publications. But again, uh, things, people can publish uh, wrong ideas about, uh, without data. See the Flat Earth uh, Initiative. It doesn't need any data to publish uh, wrong things and influence people negatively on the web. Uh, but the problem is that, uh, it, that is based on, on, not on information. The things that are based on information, we can check. And if the information is available, we can cross-check. You have some comments. Uh, Sorry, uh, because she was very... Yeah. You have, yes, uh, on this point, uh, you are not just sharing the raw data. No, it's the high-level data. High level. Yes. And this comes from a process of measuring something yes. on raw data. Yes. So the measurement may be uh, already, uh, ah, okay, but that's something that that uh, perhaps I was not so clear. Yes. Yeah. So perhaps this is something that was not so clear. So, uh, if uh, you are going to make available Swift data, you are either going to do a very authoritative uh, analysis. For example, Paulo Giomi is one of the responsibles for writing the Swift software. So, when we produce this the, this pipeline we had someone that was a big specialist. Um, but of course, the, the general public cannot produce, uh, cannot reduce formula data. Yes, they would not be able to. We are giving the final date. So the idea is that the data that we make available comes with a stamp of who produced it so that we know that it was produced by someone authoritative. We would never accept uh, in, our, in the database uh, data that was just analyzed. Of course, if the person analyzes and publishes in view format on the web, you cannot forbid. 
yes? But the idea is to have some control. Of course, we have to improve that in the sense that we can use technology like blockchain, really to know the, the procedence of the data and things like this. And then you can flag for it, you can filter uh, through it uh, when you use the data. But uh, the alternative is not to have the open information. Yes, so most of them, so we had uh, high-level ESA representatives, uh, the, the leaders of uh, uh, CDS were in the discussions that we made that they went. So all these people were invited. They have participated in the discussions in helping to define the direction of the initiative. Uh, of course, I, I think that uh, the job they do is uh, basically a fundamental job about data protocols, formats, and things. Um, in, now, the, f the initiative is not formally founded, and so there is no formal relationship with them. But they have been consulted in, f in following the procedures to create the initiative. So they are, they are all aware. If you go to talk to them, they, they, they are all aware of this. And uh, the idea is to find ways of cooperation yes, uh, with them. But again, the work that they do, maintaining the, the data format, is already fundamental for what we want to do. And uh, of course, they, they are people uh, that uh, we expect uh, we are going to be able to cooperate. There was Mose. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit off topic, but you touch in your talks uh, the uh, policy use of the space uh, as a, an heritage of the humanity. And uh, for instance, um, it is not clear whether this initiative So that's a very interesting question. So we did not have this um, uh, pretension, this expectation in the beginning. But for example, what's coming up with Space Debris, the meeting that we had two weeks ago, it was the World Space Forum, was kind of Davos of the space sector. And, uh, and it was all about Space Debris. I mean, 90% of the people want to talk about Space Debris because it's becoming a real issue, you know? Yes, you are right to say that the amount of regulations that there is is very small. So, for example, if there is a collision in space today, yeah, you don't know who is liable for it. Uh, and uh, to make, uh, so lots of, I mean, in these meetings of the UN, there is also people that is specialized in space law. So the people that do, you know, that discuss the, the laws of the use of space and things like this. So it's if for them, for example, the fact that there is no information on the occupation of the orbit and uh, the amount of space debris, how, how, how these things are, is like doing, uh, doing um, a traffic uh, law without uh, having any data on traffic, yes? So it's, it's really complicated. So when we start to get in touch with these more sensitive aspects, I think there is a possibility of having a positive impact on policy simply because we bring the information of the real situation to form. So at the moment, nobody has, except the 
this is closed deformation, a uh, clear view of uh, how the orbit, how, how, are the situ how is the situation in the orbit, yes? And, uh, and so it's very difficult to push for international regulation of how many satellites you can, do, what orbits you can use. So at some point we have to start making protected orbits, for example, like we do with frequencies. So you cannot launch your satellite at orbit X anymore, otherwise you're going to pay a fine or whatever. Uh, but today, you can do whatever you want in space. If you want to put a nuclear warhead in space today, nobody is going to be able to do anything against you. So it's, it's very You can put a car in space and nobody does anything against yes. you. <laughs> so it's, really, it's a really good question. I mean, I think that when we start sharing more information, uh, of course, I mean, the things become more clear and we can have a, a better impact on things. So yes, uh, yeah.